My connection to Roof probably started off the way everyone else's connection to Roof started off, which was with Stefan Rosser's beautiful video, um, Fascination. It was sort of mythical lore. It was the first viral automotive video. You know, this was a time when I, I think I first saw it on VHS at someone's house. You know, it, it felt kind of, this is, there was no YouTube back then. It didn't matter if you were into Porsche, if you were into Roof, if you were into anything. If you liked cars, you saw this video and all of a sudden it clicked. We like to play with our cars. Today we'd like to invite you to join us. I had ordered the Fascination VHS tape, which I watched religiously growing up and was enamored with this car. Normally a manufacturer goes to the Nürburgring to set a record. Roof went there to do an incredible drift. <laughs> a big smoky drift. And in a lot of ways, that puts them on the map. My name is Alois Ruf. I'm uh, Alois Ruf Jr. actually because I'm second generation and uh, I'm running the company that my father and my mother founded here in 1939 in this very same spot. I'm living all my life here and enjoying what I'm doing and it doesn't feel like work even though <laughs> sometimes I feel exhausted but everything in a positive sense. Well, the, the whole love affair uh, with Porsche started because my father was driving his bus on a Sunday in November of uh, 1963. And uh, here comes this Porsche 356, a Carmen hardtop, also known as the Notchback. Uh, that car passed my father's bus. And after he pulled back into the right lane, he lost control over the car and uh, ended up in the ditch, rolled it twice, my dad stops, looks after the, the man, and uh, he brought him to the hospital and calmed him down and said, don't worry, I will pick up your car. We have a car business at home, and then we talk in a couple of days. My dad ended up buying that car and fixed it, and that was our first Porsche. When people would crash them, uh, Porsche really needed somebody, a craftsman, that could get these bodies back into shape. Uh, because you couldn't just replace a fender, you had to rebuild or, or do the metal work that was necessary to get it back to shape. After we, we had this car almost one year, something totally, totally unplanned happened. My dad and I, we were driving through Munich on a Sunday afternoon, and as we were waiting at a red light, a young man comes and knocks at their side window, and, and he said, I would like to speak to you. Could you please stop? I need to talk to you. And he says, I would like to buy your car. I want exactly this car that you have. And he says, come with me to my apartment. I have the money ready for you. We ended up selling the car for a super price. Uh, he went to a candy box, the man, <laughs> and he had the money in cash. We didn't have the car papers uh, with us, of course, the title. So he said, don't worry. I give you my 356 Reuter Coupe to drive home. We had the money, we had his Porsche, and we drove home, and uh, next day we exchanged again. He picked up his car, and he got the, the car title. And my father said, I've never had anything happen in my life like this before. These Porsche people, they must be crazy. Everything is different with these people. Something is there uh, that is not normal. been always a great, great fan of the uh, 9-11, 9-11 S especially when it came out in 1966. I loved the 2.2 S, then later the Carrera RS. The uh, ratio between horsepower and weight was excellent. Too many of the cars of the new models have been, became too uh, comfortable 
too many uh, electronic gimmicks, electric motors everywhere. I think they don't belong in, into a pure uh, sports car, which is supposed to be a real driving machine. My motto has always been, when you drive one of our cars, you have to feel like you're driving your own jeans, your own pants, to make sure that the engine sounds right, uh, that the feel of the steering is right. I always try to, to build cars where you have still this feeling, you know. The desire or the market, the demand for <clears throat> modifications and making more 911 than what existed happened in the late 70s. And it was at that time when, when Porsche was uh, pulling back with the 911 and said, okay, we're going to make this car only two more years and now we're making only one model and that was the 911 SC and there was no longer a Carrera available. Uh, and the next step was, of course, the turbo, but the turbo was very, very expensive at that time. Very few people could afford that car. We were looking for this niche and saying, OK, let's make something what the people really want, because there was a lot of um, discussion in the community of the Porsche drivers, because they were all supposed to buy a 928, because the 911 was uh, the end, uh, and there is no future for a 911. Uh, so that was very difficult times because the, the real 911 lovers with the engine in the rear and the air-cooled, you could not convince them. Everybody said, yes, there may be great cars, and the 928 was a great car. It was a great achievement, but it was not a replacement. Uh, we saw, well, people will follow us if we make something like that. There is a market, there is a, there's a demand, and so we built models that were not available in Zuffenhausen, but in Pfaffenhausen. Well, the Yellow Bird was actually a project that was in our head for many, many years before. This goes back to 1979. I called it at that time the 945R, uh, which meant uh, 450 horsepower, twin turbo, a derivative of the um, 935 engine. The CTR1 was a, a car that was based on the 3.2 Carrera shell and we were using all the components, everything that we knew over so many years and we knew exactly what to do to get the maximum out of them. And it was still a wolf in sheepskin because most people just saw, oh yeah, it's a 911 that drives by, they didn't see the subtle differences, only a connoisseur would find out. And we came up with this car, we didn't know that this would be so successful and uh, even today, the whole world talks about this car. That was not expected. The original CTR to me was uh, a, a, about purity, about minimalism, it was about performance. There was nothing on that car that didn't have to be there. And so for me, that car embodied what Roof was about. I would imagine, for most enthusiasts, what brought Roof into their world was that Road & Track article in 1987, the shootout of all the supercars and how Roof excelled so brilliantly. And it, it always stuck in my mind, that is beyond cool. When I was growing up, I was constantly reading all of the automotive magazines and I would see roof snippets and articles appearing on roof. It always caught my attention. 
Road and track got interested in doing the fastest cars in Europe, and uh, Lewis Roof had built the, uh, a turbo Porsche that had won the previous, I think a couple years earlier, he had gone 100 and, I think 186 miles an hour with a, a Roof Porsche. And uh, so they invited all the usual suspects, you know, Ferrari and Lamborghini and AMG and so on, to do, do another fastest cars trip. But uh, Roof was, he had won the previous one, so he was definitely in the running to bring a, a, a Porsche Turbo. The only high-speed test we had with the car was the drive to the test. On the Autobahn in the nighttime, we were running it and the engine was cutting out. That means we, we have reached 7,300 RPMs. And then we did the calculation and we did also the stopwatch for one kilometer. And then we said, oh, it's in the upper 330s. It did that very well. We knew it would be stable at that speed. And uh, so we allowed the test drivers to drive it. My first impression was that it just was so powerful. It was like being in a dragster when it took off out of the pits. Uh, every time Paul shifted the car, it would switch slightly sideways, hit it again, and just go right up to the next gear. But the roof was a really well-developed car. It just felt brick solid and connected to the road and smooth and like it was just made to do this. We expected to be fast with that speed, but somebody else could have been faster, you know? But uh, we were by far the fastest. For sure, the Road and Track article was the first time I'd heard of them. And I immediately called up the roof distributor that was not that far away from where I lived in New Jersey, and I ordered the two VHS set, which was the fascination on the Nürburgring, and then an additional video that came with the set that was sort of a exposition of the company and their customers and what they were doing. To me, that's the first viral car video. I mean, I shared that among uh, many, many friends, and it's amazing over the years how many people you meet that saw fascination, and it just opened their minds to a different side of Porsche, which is the aftermarket and the tuning community, which is really led by, at the, at the top, uh, by roof. This is a story that is pretty much known everywhere. 29 cars were built. One car, the Yellow Bird, was the one that uh, won all the records, or made all the records. And 80 million times, the car has been in the video games. はい、で、アロイさんたちが止まってるホテルに僕が押しかけて行って、ま、ルーフをグランツリスモに収録したいって、あの、お伝えしたのが初めてだったと思います。で、オンリーシン、アム、ギルティーオフ、イズ、ハウ、
The CTR-1 was a, a car that was based on the 3.2 Carrera shell and we were using all that, uh, all the components, everything that we knew over so many years and we knew exactly what to do to get the maximum out of them. And it was still a wolf in sheepskin because most people just saw, oh yeah, it's a 911 that drives by. They didn't see the subtle differences. Only a connoisseur would find out. I was always fascinated, especially by the original CTR. Uh, the original CTR to me was uh, a, a, about purity, about minimalism, uh, it was about performance. Uh, there was nothing on that car that didn't have to be there. And so for me, that car embodied what Roof was about. Alois understands that his cars have got to be beautiful and well thought out at the same time. The next generation CTR was the CTR2, uh, which was based on the 993, which we gave a little bit more obvious styling elements, especially the rear spoiler, which was also fully functional because that rear wing was also allowing the air to come into the intercoolers and distribute the air. And uh, we, we have learned from the CTR1 how to duct the air through the intercoolers and we used all that information and brought it into the CTR2. Well, take a look at this. Parachuting into Road America, complete with a roof banner, is Steve Bedore, who is currently second overall in the one lap. When Steve Bedore was dropped off an airplane, had the roof flag and his uh, parachute and landed at the racetrack, hopped in the car and went racing. <laughs> it's just amazing stuff, you know. CTR3, a complete different animal. It's the combination of a 911 front end and a complete rear cradle made with a new frame with a birdcage and aluminium billet pieces for the axle and for the suspension. And putting the uh, six cylinder engine, the twin turbocharged engine, into the center of the car. Uh, it is supposed to be a car that is more of a streetable version of a GT1 car, of a Le Mans racer. And I think this is also what the people like, the connoisseurs who, who own these cars. To me, styling is an extension, it's a communication of the engineering. Um, it, it really kind of communicates what a car is about. Um, I, I, as much as I love something that's flamboyant, uh, I love functional design. You know, conceptualizing the new CTR was really about uh, bringing a singular focus and, and bringing back the, the absolute DNA of roof. We wanted the silhouette of this car to be so pure and identifiable as a CTR. The new CTR anniversary is a car that wins your heart. And you realize that with the people after 20 years of absence of the original shape of the CTR, that people are really have the demand and the desire again for this car. Therefore, it's such a winner. This is definitely the most ambitious project because the whole underwear, everything is from A to Z, is new with a carbon tub, with a new suspension, and uh, it's a, a lightweight car combined with the looks of the original CTR because when you see it alone and you don't see the old one next to it, then people think, oh, this could be a yellow bird, you know, from, from those days. And that's the beauty of it, you know, because it's a, it's a car that really uh, hides exactly what it is, you know. It's a, a true wolf in sheepskin again. And uh, people ask, oh, what is it based on? Is it a 964? Is it a 993? And I uh, say, no, no. Look, look at this body shell over here, and then you understand what it is.
Uh, when I'm over in, in Germany in Pfaffenhausen, um, you know, just being behind the scenes is a very unique, special place. Uh, especially working with Alois and his team, uh, which are, you know, really kind of like going into the elves in the Black Forest, you know, it's just a, an amazing place. I think without them we wouldn't be where we are. They are the makers. My husband comes with the ideas, I come with the market, <laughs> and they actually have to do it. Sometimes when they come, I have a great idea. They roll their eyes and say, oh God, not again. <laughs> it's really special to work for Roof, of course. If you look around in the shop and you see the guys, and uh, with how many enthusiasm, enthusiasm these guys are working and uh, how detailed they're working. And, and it's, it's like, a, like a family when you, when you really uh, work together and uh, everybody is pulling on the same string. Let's say the different from a roof car to, to other cars is <clears throat> that the car is really made by hand up from, from scratch. And even the, the chassis is more spot welded or more welded through and the, the chassis feels more stiffer. And the detailing of, or the components of, of the details that comes into the car makes the car a different feeling. Ähm, die Qualität der Arbeit, das Auge fürs Detail und die Originalgetreuigkeit, denke ich. Na gut, man, ja, man begleitet so ein Projekt von Anfang bis zum Schluss, also über Zerlegen, Karosserieabteilung, Lackiererei, Motorenbau, also man ist überall in dem ganzen Projekt äh, beteiligt. Und das ist das Faszinierende, dass man nicht immer gleich, die gleiche Arbeiten ausführt, sondern äh, alles macht im Auto eigentlich auch, bis von der Sattler arbeiten und so. Also ist schon. Ja gut, Prototypenbau ist, ist eigentlich äh, beginnt mit dem Besprechung, Meeting äh, vom ganzen Team. Und dann wird entschieden, auch mit dem Chef zusammen wird entschieden, das probieren wir jetzt mal und dann geht's los. Motorbau wird zuerst mal überlegt, was wir machen. Wird dann gebaut und geht dann auf den Prüfstand. Wenn es funktioniert, ist es okay. Dann geht es ins Auto und dann wird getestet, wird gefahren. Das ist ja das Spezielle hier in der Firma. Die ganzen Autos sind noch von Handarbeit gemacht. Also du kannst sagen, wenn du ein Auto aufbaust, du hast jedes Teil in der Hand gehabt, hast es geprüft, hast es begutachtet und das ist das Spezielle noch gegenüber einer Serienproduktion. Also das macht es aus, die, die Handarbeit von einem Rufsportwagen. Was wir hier machen ist von der, von der Arbeiten her, dass wir die Oberfläche versuchen so gut wie möglich rauszuholen, dass hier einfach die Qualität mehr im Vordergrund steht als die Quantität, muss natürlich mit berücksichtigt werden. Und wir versuchen hier einfach das Beste auch rauszuholen. Ähm, ja weil wir auch verschiedene Untergründe haben. Ja, wir haben Carbon, wir haben Stahl, wir haben Aluminiumverbundstoffe, äh, äh, Glasfaserverbundstoffe. Und das ist manchmal immer ein bisschen schwierig, mit den Untergrundtönen zu arbeiten, mit den äh, Grundierungen zu arbeiten, mit dem Primer, dass man zum Schluss halt auch die genaue Farbe außen, dass das manchmal passt, dass man keine Abstufung hat von den Pixelaufstellungen der, der Stoßstange vom Kunststoff zum äh, aluminium sowas. Ja. Und ansonsten ist es eigentlich so, dass wir mit den Produkten versuchen, das Maximum rauszuholen, dass wir eine vernünftige Oberfläche äh, haben im Bereich Endfinish. Ja. Und das ist eigentlich auch das, was der Kunde zuerst sieht und sich dann vielleicht auch am meisten freut. What makes Roof different is, if you go to other shops and then it's always just the normal stuff, replacing parts. So there's no actual repair of the parts. Here at Roof, we take broken stuff that you can't get anymore and we repair it. Ich denke, ab wenn man einen gewissen Qualitätsanspruch hat, wie es hier ist, dann ist es schon eine Kunst, ja.
I think what's driven Roof is the passion for building great cars. I don't think he's in it because he wants to be the richest man in Germany. He's in it because of his love for the people that own the cars and the cars themselves. He always has all the time in the world for everybody, if you notice that. It's probably one of his greatest strengths, and I have to assume if you work with him, his biggest flaw is that he's got time for you. And uh, he treats everyone fairly, and everyone, you know, if he sees that you're interested and you're passionate, he really, uh, he'll stop what he's doing, and he'll sit down and he'll, he'll tell you exactly whatever you want to know. As we, as he has proven, he has been always a visionary. Because if it wouldn't have been, he will never make it where, to, where it is today. He's a good friend. He's a good husband. And he's a good technician. He is a great thinker. And he's a lot of fun at the same time. It's not like he's, he's my genius. He has his genius, but it's not this genius boring that is only thinking. He also enjoys life and enjoys the cars. And everything he has done is because of the love of the 9-11, actually. So, yeah, you, you, you'll, you'll always have that dichotomy with them. You'll have uh, one foot in the past with a, uh, a really strong eye in the future. So that's, that's, and that's what we all want, you know? We, we don't want to give up the air-cooled 911. We don't want to give up that sensation. We don't want to give up that, that feeling of freedom and, uh, and, and this power that you get with an, an, an internal combustion engine car. But then if Roof told me tomorrow that they're coming out with, you know, an all-electric hypercar that's going to blow the doors of everybody, I'd be just as excited to drive that. I think Alois is space is really in making it fun and interactive and challenging. You want this machine and you to be one. It's something that was your dream and everything about it, uh, you know, has got to be part of that. So I would say that the future of Roof is really about staying connected with that, being a pure driving machine. I think being a small company, building limited numbers of cars per year, I think we'll continue building cars and we will continue uh, the path. I, I hope and I believe, and I'm not sure whether it's going to be 80 years, but I believe for the next 20 years we will still have a lot to do doing what we are doing. Automobiles built by Roof have a very special reputation all over the world. And if you ask us why that is, we can only answer because we're fools for cars.